So nice to see you. So I hope that you had a chance to prepare some uh, questions about yoga. And um, I'm going to go through what I have in terms of demystifying yoga to bring um, a bit the idea that yoga is not necessarily what we see in the news or what we see on TV, that yoga is big and it's way more than all of that. So we are going to do demystifying yoga, questions and answers with Felicia. So if you have any questions, you can interrupt me and ask me the question. The question, no problems. So demystifying yoga, why, why that word? Um, there are a lot of myths about yoga that exist. And hopefully this presentation will help you see that yoga is more than just an exercise routine. That's the biggest myth. A lot of people think that yoga is a series of exercises that we do to get in shape. And it's actually way more than that. I'll do it by hand. Okay, yoga through the ages. So basically, um, yoga is thought to have been around for over 5,000 years. However, much of the practice was an oral practice. And so there aren't many written texts that talk about yoga, the word yoga, 5,000 years ago. However, there are paintings, there are murals in different um, uh, old buildings that have been found through archeological finds. Um, that have shown pictures of people in positions such as mine now in Sukhasana, the easy posture, or in the lotus, uh, or even doing some of the different little mudras, uh, like dhyana. So there is that belief that it's, it's old, it's over 5,000 years old. However, we've only recently found um, items that can prove that yoga was a practice in written form uh, as of 1500 years before uh, the common era. Now, yoga is linked to not just Hinduism. So that's another myth that um, yoga is Hindu. It's from Hindu tradition. It's actually linked to Hindu, Buddhist, Jain, Sikh, and even Sufi religious traditions. It's related to uh, many spiritualities now that are using uh, yoga and even the common people who don't have a spirituality or who are just doing it for exercise purposes are using it now. So yoga is widespread. Um, sorry about that. So the yoga technique started amongst people who, at first, it wasn't yoga wasn't a practice for everybody like it is today. There was a practice for people who chose to live a life separate from the rest. So they would give up all of their worldly possessions. They would. Um, go and isolate themselves, become hermits, either in ashrams or on mountaintops, or even just as lone practitioners. Um, but they would be alone and they would be in constant uh, state of meditation. So it was for people who wanted to remove themselves from um, society, we'll say. These practices that uh, these original yogis had were passed from teacher to student, to teacher to student, to teacher to student, usually through oral traditions, through a lot of memorization, through practice. And so, um, oh, the other thing about yoga is that it was mostly pretty much practice that we know of by men. So women uh, came to yoga much later in its existence. However, since we don't know much about yoga, in all of its details before the written texts. We don't know if women participated in yoga practices um, prior to that. However, you'll see as I go through the presentation that yoga is vast, yoga is huge. And so if we think just postures, well then no one was practicing that type of yoga that we see today, 5,000 years ago. But as we go through, you will see that people every day were practicing yogic principles or yogic beliefs or yogic um, way of life. How do we know about yoga? Um, a lot of, um, not just archaeologists, but people who study religions, spiritualities, um, ancient texts, have really gleaned some information about yoga through these texts that have been found. So I decided to go through the history of the yoga through the text and the years that they were from. So 
by ever what by whatever path then love me says krishna to arjuna by that path they may come to me many are the paths of men but they all in the end come to me that is a quote from the gut by <laughs> sorry the bhagavad gita the bhagavad gita is one of the sacred texts that talks about the practice of yoga so we can see by this quote that no matter what type of yoga no matter what type of practice you have ultimately it all winds up being towards the same goal of the one which i will explain so this is the timeline of the yoga sacred text so we can see that the vedas um, are from 1500 before the common era so bce and in sam it's a text that's written in sanskrit which is the an ancient language of um the Hin hindu people of india and it means the access to the divine and to connect the earthly form with the spiritual form so making that connection of the body with the spirit what in the vedas are things like songs and poems um and it tells a lot of uh, stories of the hindu gods and it references yoga techniques in uh vedic rituals so there were rituals that were done in order to practice bringing your body and spirit together in order to reach the one um through stories of the gods and these were rituals that were performed so in the upanishads which you can see in uh 500 bc so before common era so this is before what we also call as the birth of christ or the common era which we know now so the upanishads uh were also in sanskrit and it was it describes a means to access the divine so to access that spiritual world um that is the outside of what we know what the world is around us so the divine is anything that is either more powerful or more um bigger than all of humanity bigger than the earth that we live on um and again it connects the earthly form with the spiritual so this body that we were given and who we are inside connecting them together so in this text it's a focus on the philosophy a lot of people um i've heard people say i don't do yoga because it's it's a religion and i have my own religion but in reality it's a philosophy some people call yoga a science and some people call it a technology so um you know we can we can choose how to see it um when we see that there are texts that talk about the gods i will explain later what that is about what the what the concept of god means in yoga the the word yoga was first documented we first see it in the text that we've actually been able to find and and uh, read and decipher is in the upanishads so in these texts and it talks a lot about how we have to hold back our senses so we have to remove like sight remove hearing and hold back our senses in order to be one with the divine to be one with the the universe and if there are any questions please don't hesitate um in these texts which is really interesting and when i was first year learning yoga it kind of surprised me to find this out there's no mention of physical postures so in the original yogic texts there was no practice of physical yoga it was really a way to be one with the universe and when there when there was a mention of asana asana is the word that means posture when we talk about yoga today we talk about doing asanas which are the different postures um but when asana is mentioned in the ancient text it usually just means to sit to be seated so it's it's interesting or to remain um much later the physical postures and all of those sequences that we see of like you know the flows and the vinyasas and uh putting sequence sequences of postures together that comes much later on than these original texts and when they did talk about the asanas or the postures that were seated for example if you were seated in sukhasana or in the lotus posture 
they were postures that were kept for a very long time. So practicing the concept of stillness, of not moving um, in order to block the senses and in order to become one with the divine. So I found that very interesting when I first learned that. The Bhagavad Gita is a very known text. I think every, I think almost every single yoga school where you learn to become a yoga teacher, you have to read the Bhagavad Gita as part of your cursus. And uh, the Bhagavad Gita is from 200 before the Common Era. And basically it's um, a Hindu story of moral dilemma. So it talks about, um, it gives stories about situations where you have to figure out what's the right thing and what you should do and how to go through it. And a lot of it has to do as well with meditation, which becomes one of the solutions for moral dilemmas. And the belief in the Bhagavad Gita is that meditation can overcome suffering. Because if you meditate and you remove your senses, you become one with the divine, and then you don't suffer and you're happy. So you feel good. And the Bhagavad Gita also mentions how important karma yoga is. And we will talk more about karma yoga, so keep that in mind, because we always talk about the word karma. And even that word, karma, has changed in how people view it than what it truly means. A lot of people see karma as a negative thing. So if something happens to you, let's say, um, I don't know, you're walking, your hands are full of groceries and you walk through a doorway and all of a sudden, boom, the door closes on your head. People will say, ah, oh, that's karma. So we have this, this, this idea now that karma is a negative thing, that it's, it's something bad that happens to you because you've done something and it's coming back to you. But in reality, that's not what karma is. Karma is... Um, oh, karma is not a negative word. It's not, exactly. It's not a negative word. Karma is just, would you like to share? I don't know who said that, but if you'd like, you can share what, what karma is. No, I am Harinder Kaur. I'm sorry, I cannot explain. I, I understand very well, but I cannot explain in English. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes, of course, I understand. So karma is basically what you do comes back to you, but it's not negative. It's what, what you have in the world. I mean, it's way more deep than this, but it's what you have in the world to accomplish and you have to accomplish that in order to fulfill your karma. So karma is not good or bad, it just is. And what you do and what you put out into the world is what comes back to you. That's karma. Yeah, exactly. Energy. Karma yeah, is just, if you do bad, it's get you bad. If you go good things, get you good things. It's simple word, this is. Exactly. So simply put, <laughs> karma is basically that. The energy that you put out is the energy that you will receive. Um, so Darlene, did you do that? Okay. Yes. So, so this is karma, the, the definition in here. Karma. So karma. And in Hinduism and Buddhism, the sum of a person's actions in this and previous states of existence viewed as deciding their fate in future existences. Right. So, such as destiny or fate following as an effect from cause. Right, so that's going deeper into karma. So basically karma is what you do comes back to you. So depending on what karma you lived in this world, according to some beliefs of reincarnation, your future lives will have to be um, lived to fulfill the karma from your past lives. So the life that we're living now, we are fulfilling the karma from our past lives. And what we do in this life will also determine the karma for our next life, uh, which is going deeper into it. And how your karma is determined is what you do comes back to you. And what you put out, of, what you put out creates your karmic balance. So that's what karma is about. I just have to reshare. We were talking about the Bhagavad Gita. So basically, um, it's, it's a very interesting text. I have the Bhagavad Gita, it's quite large. And it's not something that you can just read like a novel. You have to really contemplate and think about it and mull it over, um, which you will see later on is part of one type of yoga. 
So next, what is most popular today is the Yoga Sutras by Pantanjali, uh, which is also something that when you're in a school for yoga teaching, you have to read and you have to learn. And so basically it's a collection of aphorisms. Now aphorism is an interesting word, but basically it's a, con it's a collection of statements that potentially put together to try to get people to understand what yoga is truly about. Um, it's basically, it guides the lifestyle and habits that we have every day. And so it really, it creates a lifestyle. It shows a lifestyle, a way, way of living through yoga in order to attain wisdom and uh, peacefulness as well. It, um, it also describes how you can get your own personal freedom or liberation from the practice of yoga. And it talks about how to do that. And it also talks about um, prayer, worship, eating, breathing, um, attitudes, thoughts, med meditation, and even sexual relations. So it, it's really, it's, it's almost like a guidebook for how to live um, through yoga, through the practice of yoga. And we will get into that a little bit more later. Then you see that in the 1300s, common era, so that means now, like in, in the centuries that we are living now, uh, we have the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, which is a collection of um, uh, the asanas that, that exist at that time. And now we start seeing a lot of the physical postures becoming more popular. So here in this one, there are 15 postures, asanas that are um, described and eight of them are not seated. Remember before they were always seated postures. So eight of them out of the 15 are now other than just the seated postures. Um, and what's interesting is that this is the first time that Shavasana, where Shavasana is the relaxation posture that we love at the end of yoga or depending on the yoga technique um, in between postures in yoga. It's the one where you're lying down and we even call it the corpse pose. And so that the first time we see it is in this document, in the sacred text. So it's considered now a posture, even though it was practiced for thousands of years before in the tantric yoga tradition. So the next text is Shritavna Nidhi. And this one is uh, a compilation that was done in um, the 1800s, where, where it was the royal family in India, the prince of the royal family, who is really um, an avid art lover, and he loved anything to do with um, uh, meditation, spirituality, and the arts. And so what he did was he created this document, which they call a treatise on Hindu deities, music, games, natural history, meditation, and yoga. And in there, there are actually more poses, more postures that um, were put in than just the regular 15. He actually includes instructions and illustrations for 122 postures. So it becomes the kind of go-to document on postures for yoga at that time. So we see that not that long ago that the huge amount of physical postures exist in yoga. However, it doesn't take away their, their benefits and it doesn't take away um, the, the, the profound effect that these physical postures can have on the whole practice of yoga, which we will see. So yeah, some people consider that this text is the first workout text, which is interesting. Okay. So, more paths of yoga. So, in um, the text, we see that there are the four paths of yoga. So, the ultimate goal of yoga is to be happy and to lead a life that's free from suffering. So, when we talk about the four paths of yoga, these are four ways of following a practice of yoga. And each path kind of um, attracts a certain personality or a certain temperament. However, even though we separate these four paths, there's overlap, of course, like in anything in life. 
And so to be strictly on one path is, is very difficult and there's no judgment. So it, it's fine either way. So there's karma yoga, janana yoga, bhakti yoga, and raja yoga. And basically yogic philosophy suggests that the root cause of all of our suffering is that we have forgotten how to be connected to our true self. We've forgotten who we really are. And there's a bit of a disconnect. So that mind, body, spirit connection has been dissociated. And so yoga's goal is to bring it all together, which is why some people say that the word yoga comes from yug, which means to yoke, which means to unify and bring together. And all of these paths of yoga aim to do that. So they all have the same goal in that way. It's just how they go about it is different. As well, there's this um, belief that there are three impurities of the mind um, that cause avidya, which means this disconnection, this, this, uh, this forgetfulness that we have as human beings. And so there's mala, which is selfishness, uh, thinking in a way which you're only thinking about yourself. So what will benefit me? I need a car. I need this. I want this without thinking of others. That's one of the impurities that exists according to yoga, yogic um, philosophy. There's vishepa also that um, is that when we're always thinking about other things, and I know a lot of us live this. I know I have this. Every, I think every human has this issue. We have so many things going on in our mind that um, our, our head is turning and trying to focus on one thing is really difficult. And so we can call that the monkey mind. We can call that the hamster in its cage or the in its wheel. And so this is one of the impurities that stops us. It doesn't mean it's bad. It, what, it, what it means is that it stops us from being connected. It stops us from seeing our true self. So even though they're called impurities, it doesn't mean that, oh, we're horrible people if we have this. That's not what it means. What it means is that these three things are stopping us from having that yoking, that unity, that yoga is striving for. And the third one is avavana, which is not no, that we feel that we are separate from all life. So we feel that we as humans are separate from animals, we're separate from the rocks, we're separate from the sky. Whereas that concept of unity is that we are all one and we are all united and everything is pretty much the same thing. So in these four paths of yoga, the, the, the goal is to strive towards that unity, that sense of connectedness and knowing our true sense, our true self of who we are. So here it says, the paths are many, but the truth is one. That's actually Gandhi who said that. And this is true. There are many, many types of paths. So there's not one path better than another, just different ways of going about getting to the same kind of feeling of unity. So karma yoga. We talked about karma, what you give, what you put out there is what comes back to you. So karma yoga is actually the yoga of action and selfless service. So anyone who does actions that are selfless, that are not about themselves, that are for others, without needing to have glorification, um, a credit, um, somebody saying good job, um, you know, validating what you've done. It's almost like the concept that we have today of um, the, the uh, acts of kindness, the blind acts of kindness, where you do things for people without them knowing, and it's, you just feel good giving, and you don't need anyone to tell you that's a good job. So I have a modern day example of that. Um, I was at Starbucks, and I get up to the, the window, I had ordered two lattes. I get to the window and the woman says, oh, it's paid for. And I'm like, what do you mean it's paid for? And she says, oh, the woman ahead of you 
uh, paid for you. I thought she was your friend. I had no clue who that person was. I just got two lattes and somebody paid. I felt so honored that I paid for the person behind me and took off too, you know? So that, you know, random acts of kindness is part of karma yoga. So anytime you perform random acts of kindness or you, you're, you're self-giving or you are in the service of others without expecting uh, recompense or expecting to get something back, and just that feeling of doing something that makes you feel love, that is karma yoga. So some examples of people who did karma yoga are Mother Teresa. So even though Mother Teresa was not a yogi, she was performing karma yoga. Um, and also we have Gandhi. I'm sure you can think of other examples of people who uh, performed, kar who practiced karma yoga. Um, you know, so, and it doesn't always have to do with yoga. Now, there are a lot of people who will give yoga classes because they just feel good giving yoga classes to people who um, might not have the money to have a course or take the course or um, for example, my mentor, Dr. Bali, he, um, he, he used to give yoga classes to uh, women who were suffering from breast cancer or who were, who were going through chemotherapy or who were um, in rehabilitation phase. And he, he would give yoga classes uh, for stress relief and to help them cope with what they were living. Um, and he did that. That was his karma yoga. He did it just because he enjoyed it. He didn't expect anything back. He didn't do it for any glory. Um, now I'm talking about it, so I am giving him a little bit of glory, but he's not here, so he doesn't have to know. It's with, excuse yeah. me, it's with the, uh, karma yoga. It's our soul is be happy. Exactly. So that's beautiful. Thank you. When your soul is happy, karma, karma yoga makes your soul happy, 100%. And that's why you would do karma yoga. So it's not for any validity on the outside, it's only for you and it helps make you feel good. So that's why I love this picture that I chose um, because this is a, a Sikh who is going to refugee camp and just they set up a bakery, they set up, they've given giving water uh, to refugees and they just, they just give of their time and they just, with so much love, it's all about giving love and passing love on to others. And then you feel intense love and that feels good. So it's, it's like that amazing um, cycle. So people who are attracted to karma yoga are obviously people who, you know, are community oriented, um, who maybe have an outgoing nature, uh, who enjoy helping others, who who have that that um, that that love inside of them that feels good, and karma yoga also purifies the heart and it burns away the uh, selfish tendencies that people might have because the more you give, the more love you feel. So karma yoga karma is actually an interesting thing because what you put out is what you get back, but not necessarily in the same form. So if this man is, is giving so much, what is he getting back? He's getting back love and he's getting back that feeling, as you said, uh, of happiness in the soul and that, that feeling of joy inside. So that is what comes back. That's his karma coming back. Um, so yeah, no expectation of personal gain or recognition. And all actions are done with a focus on the oneness. So there is that concept very strong in karma yoga that we are all one and so if we are all one then we are all helping each other and even by helping out others it helps us out because we are all one and it's just that whole concept that there's this belief in everything is all together and one yes um here it says there's a connection with the atman or true self so it depends there's a belief that some people identify that one as God, some people call it Atman, and some people say it's the self because we are one and we are part of that whole uh, universe, that whole concept of God, Atman, self. It's all one. There's, there's no distinguished. So 
um, divinity is also us. We are divinity within. So beautiful. I love it. And um, so those are the four paths. I'm just going to, uh, that's the path of karma yoga. I apologize. So the second one is Janana yoga. And this one is the yoga of the will and the intellect. So this, this path of yoga is one of knowledge. Uh, looking for wisdom and knowledge and having constant inquiry, trying to always understand, trying to question, trying to find truths, to find answers. And it's done through meditation, but it's also done through um, self-inquiry. So self-reflection, going within, understanding self as related to the whole. And also the study of the ancient texts, which is called Sadhyaya. Now, by studying those texts, they gain more knowledge, those who follow this path, and they're constantly questioning, and they're constantly delving deeper into who they are to find their true self. However, there's a little bit of caution because some people believe that just by studying ancient texts, you can then reach that concept of oneness and wholeness. However, the caution is put out there that we have to also practice meditation and we also have to practice self-reflection. It cannot just be about the text. The text and the mind are the tools that are used to achieve that unity. Whereas in karma yoga, the, act, the selfless act of giving is how we achieve that state of unity, that state of um, wholeness. So... Basically, um, this path of knowledge is based on the premise that um, avavana, which is ego-based ignorance, it keeps us from knowing our true nature. So if we're too focused on our ego, on our self-identity, you know, on I am Felicia, I am a teacher, I'm good, I can do this. And if we focus only on that, we will have a hard time finding our true self because that's exterior to us. It's, it's, um, it's a shell, it's a label. And so by, by contemplating, by using logic and reason and inquiring into your, its own nature, we then can reveal the truth that's within us. It's also very beautiful. And this one is believed to be the most, most direct path to insight and illumination. And this one is from 400 before the common era. The next one, oh, stopped working. Back to yoga. Okay. The solution is love, surrender, and devotion to the divine qualities in everything. So back to yoga is really, it's that, that you're always going towards the divine. So in um, it's the belief that a lack of faith in the divine or sacred essence has caused us to lose a connection to our divine self. So there's that belief that we need that connection to the divine in order to be connected to ourselves, to know our true selves. So they're very similar. There's some overlaps. It's just often it's how it goes about it. So this one is through contemplation, through meditation and through prayers to a God or to a divine or to a deity or to the universe or to the cosmos. So it's really bringing yourself to be in touch with the divine in a daily, every day, every moment, every minute way. So it's much more focused on the divine. So this one is to purify again and to transform. And it focuses on the mind and sacred thoughts. So basically Bhakti will really, Bhakti yoga path will really be one where you're focusing on the positive. So not the negative. You're not going to say, um, you know, I don't know. Oh, I went to work today and it was such a hard day. You're going to focus on what are the beautiful things that I live during the day? What are the things that are positive? What are, you know, instead of complaining about the dishes, being feeling honored that we have dishes. Um, I, I'm simplifying it, but it's, it's pretty much that. Instead of being upset that our child 
um, is taking a tantrum, we feel honored that we have a child. We feel honored that the child has vocal cords to actually be able to make noise. Um, we feel honored that our child is developing a self-identity. So it's, it's, it's looking at things in a different way where it's not focusing on the negative and it's not focusing on, um, again, that karma that you send out there those positive thoughts bring about positive things and make others, it's, it's contagious. So it makes other people also feel the positivity that's coming from you. And so the belief in back to yoga is also that you need to surrender, you love, you surrender to, um, to everything that is divine and all the qualities in everything. You look at a flower and you see the, the beauty and the divinity that is within that flower. So it's, it's seeing the divine in everything and transferring all of our love and emotions into that divine, just that love for deity, for divine and divinity. And then this can be done through chanting, puja, and devotional rituals. So a lot of time is spent in, in, in devotional practice, um, doing mantras, uh, chanting, depending on which tradition you're from. But back to yoga is basically that. So it's more, it's like the, the very spiritual path. And this would, call, this would attract people who are quite emotional, who um, feel, well, they're all spiritual, but who really feel that need and that calling towards um, connecting with deity and divinity. And then Raja Yoga. So those three are the paths that were actually mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita. And... Then recently, Raja Yoga has been added as the fourth path. And Raja Yoga came about with Pantanjali's Yoga Sutras. So this is the yoga of meditation. So this one's known as classical yoga. Uh, Pantanjali described the eight limbs of yoga, which is Ashtanga, which means eight limbs. And in, that's pretty much what we're following today in the Hatha Yoga and uh, classes that we, we follow. It's, it's pretty much following the classical approach, the Raja Yoga. Um, so basically it's control the intellect and thoughts through meditation, uh, where you are breathing, well, there are different tools to do that. You are breathing, you are chanting, and the goal is to stop that hamster wheel, to stop that monkey in the mind, and to be able to control, control is a funny word, but to be able to kind of push the thoughts away and focus on what's happening now in the present moment, as opposed to I'm sitting here meditating, wondering what am I gonna make for supper? What are the kids doing? Oh my gosh, did I take the dog out? Um, so this type of yoga is about meditation to center yourself in the now, in the moment, so that you can really just enjoy being and just being and feeling great in the moment. Again, you're identifying yourself with the universal self. So when you get into that moment where you can just the thoughts, are, you know, yeah, we have thoughts, we acknowledge them, but then we, we focus on the moment, focus on the breathing. And by doing that, we begin to feel that connection with everything because we're no longer worrying about the past. We're not worrying about the future. We're not anxious about what's going on before. We're not anxious about what's about to happen. We are just now, right now. And by being in that meditative present state, we can connect to the oneness of the universe, which is our true self. So it's very contemplative and it requires a lot of self-discipline. So the tapas are self-discipline. I will get more into that afterwards. It also talks about purity, which is Vatmakarya, which we will talk about as well. And this one is from around 200 common era. So, those were the four paths of yoga. Now, some people really follow just one. You know, this is what I'm doing. So in bhakti yoga, much of the time, there will not be any posture except for the seated ones for meditation. Uh, with raja yoga, well, when hatha yoga came uh, along, we started seeing that 
practicing postures, practicing movement helped bring about a state of meditation because it helps to um, use the senses so that we're focused on that and in the moment, we're focusing on our breath with the movement and it helps bring us into the now. So in the Raja Yoga type, um, we have Pantanjali who described the eight limbs of yoga. Now, why I love this is because the eight limbs of yoga, when I first learned about the eight limbs of yoga, I was in heaven because it made me really understand that yoga was not just another aerobics class, that yoga was not um, just, you know, to lose weight or to go to hot yoga and, and, and sweat and go to sauna. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but that it's just, that's not just what yoga is about. I felt that it was so much more and practicing postures and practicing meditation, I was feeling that oneness with the universe. And so learning about the eight limbs of yoga awoke that feeling of amazing splendor within me that yes, I got it, I understood. So I love talking about the limbs of yoga. Now, the reason why they call them eight limbs is like branches, almost like they're, um, a lot of times the eight limbs of yoga are compared to a tree. And so you have the base and then you have the branches that come off of it. So these are the eight limbs of yoga. Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi. A lot of people have heard of Samadhi as lists and the top. A lot of people have heard of the asanas, which are the postures. And a lot of people know what pranayama is, especially if you took the breathing techniques or if you're part of my yoga, you'll know that pranayama is the practice of breathing. And the other ones, not many people know about when I speak about them. So it's nice to learn about them. So very quickly, yama is the restraints and moral disciplines or moral vows. So it's it's what we should not do. Niyama is the things you should do, the positive duties or the observances that you should have in your daily life. The asana we know is posture, pranayama, breathing techniques. Pratyahara is that sense withdrawal. So when you're taking a yoga class, one of the things that happens is we have music, we have a teacher talking, we have breathing, we have yoga uh, postures, and all of that is to try to remove those senses and so that you're not focusing just on the senses. They're so bombarded that you're focusing on now, the present moment. However, there are some traditions who uh, believe that in order to really remove your senses, you need to have no music, no sound, no even no lights um, in order to really remove all of the um, input into your senses. So just different techniques to getting the same, um, to trying to get the same objective. Pratyahara, okay, sensory withdrawal. Dharana is focused concentration. So when you're trying to really focus even when we're doing postures and we mention focus on a point, the drishti, which is a focal point, or concentrating on your breathing, that is part of dharana. And then you have dhyana, which is meditative absorption, which dhyana comes after dharana. Dharana prepares you for dhyana in order to really be absorbed in a meditative state. state. If if I'm not breathing properly, if I'm not uh, focused, well, I'm going to have a hard time meditating. And then the ultimate bliss or enlightenment is samadhi, which is after you have you know, done all of this and you're at a state where whoop, there's nothing else. You just are one with the universe and living bliss. So in the yamas, what not to do, there are five of them. So just to clarify again, the eight limbs of yoga, they don't have to be all done like in order, in order for things to work. Sometimes they're like life, they're all over the place. So you might be working on a yama, you might be working on your pratyahara, it, you know, um, but ultimately for samadhi, it's nice when everything kind of comes together and it makes that moment of bliss. 
So in the yamas, these are the things you're not supposed to do. Because yoga is not just about postures and moving. It's about a way of life. It's about, it's a philosophy. And some people even say it's a science for, for self-healing and for, um, for, for, for self-knowledge and self-reflection. So they help us, the yamas help us regulate our behavior, how we interact with people and how, like at work, at home, everywhere. Um, okay, so one of them is ahimsa, nonviolence. This one I talk a lot, a lot about in yoga. It's nonviolence to others, but also to yourself. So when you're doing something and you're judging yourself, oh, I didn't do that well enough, or oh, I can't do this posture, or oh, I'm going to fail this test, that's ahimsa. That's not ahimsa. You're, you're actually being violent towards yourself by putting yourself down or by judging yourself. So ahimsa is not doing that. It's finding the positive. It's not allowing yourself and just saying, oh, this is where I'm at. This is what I'm able to do at the moment. That is good for now. Uh, it does not mean that you don't strive to go further. It just means you accept your limitations, you accept who you are, and you know that you're always going to go maybe that little millimeter further, and that's good. So ahimsa is really nonviolence, nonviolence to self, nonviolence to others, nonviolence to the world. So some of the examples here are by refusing to gossip because gossip hurts. If you're hurting others, you are not practicing ahimsa. Satya, truthfulness, basically not lying, telling the truth. Now, these are things that we're used to. Our parents told us all the time, don't tell lies, don't tell lies. But truthfulness is not just telling lies to other people. It's telling lies to yourself, making sure that you're truthful with yourself as well. That's really hard, and it's very important. Ateya is non-stealing. So you don't take things from other people. Now, that doesn't just mean... Uh, the first time I, I saw this, I thought it was kind of funny because I'm like, well, I would never steal anything. And it goes further than that. It's not just non-stealing. It's not taking what's not yours. So even um, that, that concept of having an affair or even that concept of taking pictures off the internet that don't belong to you. Um, by the way, whenever I do my presentations, I try to find all the, the, common, the, the free stock that you're allowed to use. And um, at the end of my PowerPoint, I put them all in there, even though I don't show it, but I, I make sure that I acknowledge everything that I use. It's important, you know, um, not plagiarizing. Plagiarizing when you're doing your homework and you're writing a text, that's stealing. So Athea is really interesting because it goes much deeper than just, you know, vandalizing, walking into someone's home and grabbing something or stealing money from a bank. It goes to every branch of our lives. Uh, Brahmacharya is trying not to overindulge. So if we love chocolate, have a small piece. But if you're eating five chocolate bars, that is overindulgence. So Brahmacharya is, it takes a lot of self-discipline and it's not easy, but trying to practice it. Now in all of these things, when you are practicing um, the eight limbs of yoga and you are practicing your yama, the yamas, if you have a hard time with it, you don't judge yourself. You practice ahimsa. So I like how ahimsa is first, which means nonviolence, because if you're having a hard time with all the other ones, you might judge yourself and say, oh my God, I did that and that's horrible. No, it is what it is and you just keep trying and you just keep trying and everything is good. <laughs> Um, aparigraha is non-greed and non-possessiveness. So that um, is also about, you know, wanting everything now. N Yoga says that you can own things, but as long as you're not attached to them, as long as it's not something that you absolutely have to have. If you just want something because it might make you happy in that moment, that's okay. But it's the greed component. It's the um, hoarding or when uh, you, you're focused only on maybe material things or, or gaining things or gaining um, that could be also hurtful for others. So it's about not being greedy and not being uh, overly possessive. So it also has to do in relationships. When you have a relationship with someone, if you are very possessive and you don't want them to do anything and you don't want them to leave, 
that could be difficult and hurtful to that person, but even more so to yourself. So according to this, according to the yamas, we need to practice aparigraha. That basically we are not holding on to people and stopping them from being who they are or, or, or moving forward in their own path. Are there any questions? No? Okay. So, niyama. This is what we have to do. This is what we're supposed to practice on. And this refers to our inner world, who we are. So we want to practice saucha, purity, santosha, contentment, tapas, self-discipline, training the senses, but, uh, sadhyaya, which we talked about before, self-study and inner exploration, ishvara, pranidana, which is surrender. Oops. And... When we talk about purity, purity does not just mean like the traditional sense of where we say we have to be pure and we have to be good and we have to be perfect. That's not what purity means, but purity is also about cleanliness. If you're doing your yoga practice, you're doing it in a space that feels good and is clean for you. If you're going to work, you're making sure that you're clean. If you're interacting with others, you're going to speak with purity of speech, non-hurtful. Um, if you are... Um, it's about being positive and, and being clean in your thoughts, clean in your mind, clean in everything that you do. And that creates a, a level of self-respect that helps you interact with others in a way that's healthy and helps others interact with you in a way that's healthy. And it's also about respect for others. So one of the examples that's often given is if you, let's say, go to a yoga class, you expect that the yoga studio is going to be clean. You don't want to lie down on a floor that's filthy. But you also have to respect and not go there dirty, smelling or, or you know, whatever. And you also don't want your teacher to be smelly or et cetera. So it's basically that, that concept of purity and cleanliness is a respectful thing as well for others not just about being pure and, and like perfect. Um, so it's like, it's cleanliness of body, mind, and spirit. Right. So there are different cleansing techniques that are used. So, so some of you may know it's become a, a new fad. The neti pot, it looks like a little teapot and you put water in it with a little bit of salt and then you pour it into one nostril and it cleans you out. And then you do it on the other side. That's to clean out the sinuses. So there are many practices in traditional yoga and in um, doing the niyamas to help clean your body. One of them is swallowing um, this, this material into the stomach and then pulling it out to clean out the intestines. Um, another one is, um, my guru did this, he, he put um, like this tube in through his mouth, out through his nose and almost like dental floss and cleaned out his sinus passages. And when you're watching something like that, it's not very pleasant because, you know, we have this attitude that these kinds of things are, are not necessarily um, fun to look at. However, it is an amazing hygiene process that people have been using for thousands of years to keep themselves clean, cleaning out the sinuses, cleaning out the intestines, um, and there's more, doing edemas and cleaning out the, the back of the lower intestines. And so that's part of Saucha. Yeah. So Santosha is contentment. So this one's interesting too, because we think of contentment like, yay, I got three cars, I'm content, or things like that. And yeah, having three cars can make us happy in the moment because we need them or whatever. But contentment goes way deeper than that. Contentment is that feeling that you appreciate everything around you, that everything you feel a sense of appreciation and gratitude for, uh, that you're not always saying, well, I'll be happy if, or I'll be happy if, or I'll be happy when, I'll be happy when I get a new car, I'll be happy when I get a new house, I'll be happy when my, 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 my mother moves out, I'll be happy when that, that is not contentment. So Santosha is really practicing gratitude and appreciation 
it's actually quite fun to practice that and think about it because we do as a society we tend to go towards you know like oh well i need to go this climb that ladder and always get more and get more so this practice of the santosha makes you realize that what you have you can be grateful for and happy it doesn't mean you can't get other things but it means that you appreciate what you have and then we talked about self-discipline uh that a lot of these things take a lot of self-discipline because you know we're busy in life and we have a lot of things on our minds we have a lot of things that we're working on and it's hard it's really hard um but the tapas teach us that we have to be self-disciplined in order to you know burn away the impurities that exist within us in order to be good and, and create that sense of oneness and that sense of uh, awe to the world around us. So self-study we talked about, and then Ishvara Padnidana is surrender. So surrendering to um, just the deities, surrendering to the feeling of being that we are part of a whole, that we are all pretty much made of the same thing. and that um, the collective consciousness is who we all are. We are all part of that. So that's what that surrender is. So you see, it's, they come back. The themes come back. Asana, the seat. So basically, the seat. But the seat means um, the physical postures of sitting steady and being comfortable. Uh, but it also means to hold, to contain, to be. So that's what asanas originally were. They were a method to hold and to be in order to be able to meditate. Um, and then, yeah, so there's a yoga fad, especially hot yoga. So there are popular yoga now that are all about postures and moving, 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 the vinyasas, the flows, and the, they're great. They're amazing. They, they help your body get stronger. Um, however, that's not the original of what the asanas meant. But things change and things evolve. And now we have the physical postures as well. Pranayama, breath regulation, just that feeling of bliss. I love this picture because they look so happy just to be there and breathing. Um, so it's the practice of breath control, which has a really deep effect on our body. Those of you who took the course with me on uh, Breath is Life felt it. And those who do yoga and practice pran, uh, pranayama feel the benefits. And then why? Because shallow breath <laughs> triggers that stress response that we have that we talked about with the, the alarm clock going off in our body. And it's hard to be relaxed when you're not controlling your breath and you're not making it flow evenly. So st slow and steady breath releases calm and breathing sets the stage for meditation. If you're, <laughs> and you're <laughs> breathing like this, you can't focus, you can't have dharana, you can't have, uh, you know, you can't get to dhyana, you just can't. So you need to be able to control your breath. Pratyahara, which is going into the senses, feeling inside, going inside, as opposed to paying attention to all the senses around us. And I love this image, the turtle. You know how turtles, they go and they go into their shell? Well, that's what uh, Patahara is like. Although you're not hiding, but you're just blocking all of these senses, the, the, the sensorial, the touch, the taste, the smell, the hearing, um, and the, the seeing. You're, you're, you're blocking all of that out so that you can focus. Dharana, which is the initial state of meditation, which is to hold the focus power of concentration, slowing down your thoughts again, and focusing on one object. So when we sing mantras, when we, we chant, when we do postures, all of that is in the goal of focusing on what you're doing so that the thoughts melt away. That hamster, that monkey in the mind, bye-bye, gone. And it's preparation for Diana. So dhyana is the intermediate stage of meditation. It's absorption. It's when you become absorbed in that moment of now. 
and it's deep consciousness and it's you have an awareness around you but you're not thinking you're it's almost like a different kind of sensing but it's just you are you're just being and then samadhi you see this picture where he has the light around him it's like that that total enlightenment that total sense of you know um one with the universe and it's a transcendental state it's a state where you've transcended this world and you just are with everything and it's bliss and pure consciousness you know everything you are aware of everything now i'm just going to check the time okay so before i continue does anybody have any questions that might relate to what we just talked about that could help you go deeper or understand a little bit more or did you have any questions that kind of relate to what we've spoken about did you already have any questions uh, yes i want to know do you read all the gita if i read the whole bhagavad gita uh, the whole gita yeah No, I'm halfway. Okay. <laughs> Have you read the whole thing? No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> It's part of my process. I'm because re- I'm reading about I'm reading uh, about 10 books and I go between them because it's so deep and intense. There's so much like I have to meditate on everything I'm reading. <laughs> <laughs> so it's taking me a really long time but um well, I'm saying that my goal was to finish in December. Oh, oh, I'm I'm hoping I will finish by December. But I encourage you to read it. I am happy I'm listen I think I'm this is you very nice uh, explaining you come like uh, all is like Hindu religion Indian woman. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Well, I love it. I feel it. It's uh, it's something I I really adore. I'm very Vid- passionate about my yoga. <laughs> okay. Um very nice. I like the um ahisma, the non what ways it it you know, you can pers- you can perceive it, you know? Like I mean it's not it not only towards others but also towards yourself. And many times that's what we do. It's it's I think we do a lot of our a, a lot of harm to ourselves because we take ourselves for granted and you know and I mean I I it's it's a beautiful way of seeing it and trying to reflect and to see where you know sometimes we make the errors you know of um so excellent wonderful I agree I love ahimsa and yeah. it's very interesting because ahimsa is important You know how we talk about karma yoga where it's the selfless surface to others mm. it's selfless but at the same time it has to be ahimsa and in karma yoga it's very clear you still have to follow your path you still have to respect your responsibilities you are like karma yoga doesn't mean give everything up and leave your family and go and you know volunteer to the whole rest of the world that's not karma yoga because you're actually doing harm if you do that mm-hmm. right so yeah. karma yoga is really about first you have to be solid in yourself and you have to be able to go through the 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 yamas and the niyamas and you have to go through your path if you have a family abandoning your family to go volunteer for other people is not karma yoga staying and helping your family is actually more karma yoga than doing that so ahimsa is amazing because it goes through every single sphere of our life it touches everything and if you live just by ahimsa wow what a beautiful world if we never did violence to ourselves or to others because sometimes like you said angela the worst violence we do is to ourselves mm-hmm. right and we yeah. judge ourselves and we put ourselves we down and and we overdo sometimes to, for others and we don't realize that you know well we need to take time for ourselves as well 100% yeah. i agree with you beautiful that said thing that i found very enlightening because i'm uh, i'm a very bad case of that <laughs> I do I do I do and then there is no time for me you know <laughs> and that, right. that and 
<laughs> and so now you're realizing that by doing that, yeah. you're actually, you're giving to others, but you're harming yourself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 And you know what I love too is that we have a hard time saying no. I have a hard time saying no. Okay. I do. And ahimsa, I have to look at it and think, okay, I, maybe I should say no because that would be actually the least detrimental thing for me. Yes, right? I know, but I want to do it. Do you understand? Like I want to help the others, but then I realize that then I have less time for me. Like, you know, that's... <laughs> Hundred percent, and it doesn't mean you don't want to help others, and that's that's the thing, eh? People perceive that if I say no to something, people are going to think, "Oh, I don't want." No, but you, it's not about that. It's okay. I want to do it, but is that the best course of action? Yeah. Right. Yeah, and we're often afraid of judgment from others, but if we don't judge ourselves. Yeah, we won't, but we that, won't worry about judgment from others. Yeah, but not necessarily the judgment of others. What worries me, that person needs me now, so I gotta be there. You understand that? That's the thing that sometimes I say, you know, like <laughs> it, it's hard. Like, and I realize that sometimes it is sort of violence towards me because I don't have the time for my things. You 100%. know, hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so very, interesting, very interesting. Very, you can meditate very, on ahimsa tonight. <laughs> yes, I will. I will. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, I got I got my daughter, my granddaughter, to take care of to 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 take care of Vanya to of Joanne for today and tomorrow. So I'm okay. I'm gonna relax there tomorrow. Go. <laughs> there you go. Excellent. <laughs> Are there any other um, realizations or questions? No, I don't have a question. I said, after Gita, you have to read Granth Sahib. There you find so many more things. Which one? Granth Sahib. What you showing the picture? The sick man. They work with the social. They helping people. Granth yeah, Sahib. Siva. That's about the Siva. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Nice. I'll put it on my list of the million books I want to read. <laughs> Just keep Granth Sahib. Run Sahib? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I will. They're, they're all wonderful. They're all, you know, I mean, uh, it was really uh, awesome. I took them all. I'm going to go over them because they're, they're, they're all very, very interesting. Awesome. What I'll do is um, I will create, um, I'll put my notes, like what you saw, I will put it on um, an Adobe uh, PDF and I will make sure that you guys get a copy. Okay, so do we want to continue a little bit? Um, one of the things that I'm often asked about are the chakras. So I was thinking that we could just go over them to understand them a little bit. A lot of people have questions about the chakras because we hear a lot about it and it has become something, um, it's been something that's considered new age. And to be honest with you, um, the chakras are something that I chose to learn later, like I focused more on uh, my yoga practice, on my meditation. And because I had this strange feeling that chakras were this new age thing, because I knew a lot of people who had done Reiki. And I mean, I respect it all. But for me at the moment, back then, I just, it didn't call to me. And now, um, the more I, the more I study, because I never stop and I just keep going. Um, the more I study, the more I get interested in all the aspects and what are the chakras about. So the chakras are energy centers that every single person has. And they actually have been in the yogic tradition for a very long time as well. So yes, there is a, there are other types of energy healing methods um, that aren't necessarily linked to the chakras, but the chakras are actually um, they've been here a long time and they are a part of yoga. So what it means is a vortex or a wheel. Now what's interesting is when I started doing kundalini yoga, one of the things that is done is um, there's a lot of breathing and a lot of 
uh, work that you do to open up all of your chakras, all of your energy centers, and to create a spiral of energy that goes up, 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 and then opens up into the crown. When I first heard about that, I thought, nah, that's crazy. What is that? And then I went and tried it, and I uh, practiced some Kundalini, and I felt it right away. And I felt that energy spiraling all you know, up my spine, and I felt this opening incredible at the top of my head. And I thought, okay, this is not crazy. This is actually interesting. Because I tend to be very doubtful when I first learn something, which is why I then, you know, self-study and then I inquire and I have inquiry and, you know, I want to know more. And actually feeling it and experiencing it makes it so much easier to share the knowledge of it. And so that's why I wanted to share it with you. And that's why it means a vortex or a wheel. So a vortex is like this big space that spirals and you go into it. So it's like a vortex that comes and spins up or a wheel that spins up towards the heavens, I guess, towards the universe. So they are energetic centers in the body and they transform your energy. Um, and each of these energy centers touches on organs in your body. And so it's not just about, you know, the, the, the energy in the world. It's also the energy that's part of what your body needs and lives in order to survive. And the more we advance in science, the more we realize how energy is, is our food, it's our fuel, how whatever we eat is transformed into eventually, through a process, energy that our body can then use to perform whatever functions it needs. So by unblocking our chakras, we're actually allowing that energy that our body needs to flow in order for all our organs to function, in order for our blood to flow, and even to be able to breathe properly. I find that so fascinating. So they affect organ functions, hormonal activities, your emotions, and your thoughts, which is fascinating. So the first chakra, now if I go back, you'll see there's different lights, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, and then the top one is seven, the crown. And if you look, they're each associated to a specific part of your body, which is really fascinating because it's actually the energy that's in that area affects the organs and, and, and the elements that are there. So Muladhara chakra is the first one at the base. So it's part of the, the bottom of your body. And that's your vital energy. It's interesting because with a lot of the work that I've been doing over the years, I realized that if that energy center is not clear, is not comfortable, is not happy, um, it's hard for the rest of them to be. It's hard for the whole body to feel energized. It's hard for the whole body to really circulate and move and feel good. So it's really important to have a good base, which makes sense because even when we build a house, if we don't have a good base, the house falls down. So same thing with our body, you need a good base. And that base talks about perseverance. Well, if you don't have a solid base, you're not going to persevere. If you're feeling like, you're not going to have that energy and that motivation to act. So it's really interesting. And that uh, that chakra is also really um, good for having resistance, like resistance to uh, emotional upheaval, resistance to dis-ease. Dis so disease means dis-ease, the lack of ease, the lack of wellness. Um, it helps you also, like when you're, if you're like this, you don't have, you don't look like you have self-confidence and you don't feel it either but when your root chakra is really well grounded and you're you mix that with your core uh wow you have self-confidence you can stand up for yourself you you can do anything right so that base is so important also it touches on the adrenal glands um and you'll see there's four petals on the lotus so each of the symbols of the chakras is a flower it's a lotus and there are different petals uh, different numbers of petals for each of them. Okay, so the sacrum is the second one. 
so it's in your sacrum. And that one is about being self-aware of your own body. Uh, it's healing energy, it's your fertility, so all of your reproductive organs are in that area. And um, a lot of people say feminine energy. I personally, you know, feminine energy, we're associating feminine with certain attributes of what being feminine is. Nowadays with, you know, uh, this whole this whole controversy about gender identities, it's harder to use that concept, but basically what it means is maybe the, the softer side of us, that, that uh, nurturing side uh, that everyone has, not men, not women, both. Um, you know, all of those qualities that are considered feminine, but that, or maybe more the, the yin part of us, if we look at uh, Chinese medicine. Um, so, you know, that, that gentleness, the nurturing, the caring, um, uh, that, the, 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 you know, the, the, the selflessness and those types of things, they're usually associated with sacral. Now, since guys and girls both have sacral, maybe we shouldn't call it feminine energy, but it is that type of energy, that softer energy. It's also your joie de vivre, so where your joy comes from. And like when you get those, I don't know if you've ever like had huge giggles come up. It usually comes up from there and then goes into the heart and vitalizes you. And uh, it's about the genital glands because that's the reproductive area, the genitalia, et cetera. And then Manipura is the belly button. So it's like right here, but it's, it's like the solar plexus. So actually it's kind of, they call it the belly button, but it's kind of, it's not just in one spot, it's, it's a bit more global. And that's where compassion, sensitivity, empathy, desire, spontaneity um, come out. And it's, it's, it's the, the light that comes out of you. That's why it's yellow. It's like the sunshine. In, in our souls, it's, it's who we are. This is, this is radiant and beautiful. And the pancreas is the organ that is mostly touched in that area. It's a very important organ that helps uh, regulate a lot of hormones and also that helps um, uh, the circulation in our body. Then we have anahata, the heart chakra. That's right here. And it's funny because when we think of the heart, we think of red, we think of love. That's that's certain symbology that we have, but in the chakras, the heart is green. And I personally love that it's green because I love nature. I love the plants. I love the earth. I love everything that has to do with greenery. So to me, it makes sense that the heart would be green. So that's my association. And it's the, the center of love, self-esteem. When you feel love for yourself, you feel self-esteem. And then again, that's, you know, that's all about knowing your own true self. When you have love for humanity, like in karma yoga, uh, it comes from the heart center. Uh, even creativity and, and you know, when, when you get those creative bursts and it just flows out of you, that's from the heart, the heart uh, center. Forgiveness and also tolerance. And the organ that's touched is the thymus. Then we have Visuddha, which is the throat chakra. This is interesting because a lot of people that I speak to feel that the throat chakra is when um, you have a sore throat or that it's going to heal your sore throat. But what's interesting about the throat chakra is that that is our voice. That is where we speak. That is where our communication comes out. So if our throat chakra is blocked, maybe we're not voicing what we have to voice. Maybe we're not saying what we have to say. And some people have noticed that if they're having issues in their throat and they're having um, like a lot of sore throats or polyps in the throat, or they're losing their voice, often it's associated with the emotional state of feeling that you cannot express yourself, that you do not have a voice. And the, the real way to heal it is not with antibiotics, but to start expressing yourself and saying what you need to say. And a lot of people, have gone that route, I've met quite a few, and all of their throat problems went away when they started expressing themselves. Because if you, if you feel your body, whatever you're feeling emotionally affects your body. If I'm stressed out, everything tenses. If I feel that I don't have the right to speak, my vocal cords might close, my throat might contract. So there's an actual physical, energetic, emotional connection altogether in all of these. 
Um, so your individuality as well comes from the throat because you're individual. How do you know you're an individual when you express yourself, when you can be who you want to be? If you're holding back and you're not saying things and, and you're refraining from expressing yourself, are you truly demonstrating your individuality? The, the gland that's being uh, touched by that is the thyroid, which is interesting because in yoga, I'm also, uh, I also teach about the bandhas, which are locks. And one of the locks is to lock your chin against your chest. And that is extremely good for massaging the thyroid and helping activate the thyroid to prevent thyroidism, hypothyroidism, et cetera. So it's really interesting. The other thing um, that the parathyroid because it says thyroid and parathyroid, the parathyroid glands, uh, they control the calcium level in your body. So calcium is one of the only elements that actually has four glands that help control it because it's so important for our body, which are the parathyroid glands. There's four of them. Ajna, the third eye. A lot of people hear about the third eye. There's, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of uh, pictures um, from, from different ancient uh, scriptures, texts um, that have been found where you see almost like a cyclops, which is believed that it might be the third eye. Uh, it's, it's that concept of the third eye. Sometimes you see people with the three eyes, like you have normal eyes, that's another one here. So the third eye is your self-awareness and where the creative energy comes out, your intuition, your spiritual awareness. Um, your uh, imagination and the pituitary gland, which is in the brain, just in the back of the brain. And so this third eye is that, that, that concept of awakening to everything around us, having that, you know, that oneness that we talk about. And then we have the crown. And the crown has a thousand petals because it is infinite and there's so much potential. And that is your full link with the universe. So here's the awareness, and then this is the universe. And it's your spiritual strength, it's knowing. When you when you have like that aha moment of something, it's like it comes out of here, that inner, vis inner vision, uh, et cetera. And so that's from the pineal gland. So those are the chakras. And there are many different ways to open up the chakras. There are many different ways to, um, to get that energy moving. Um, one of the things that we practice a lot are the Kriyas. And as one of my mentors has said, the Kriyas are there to help people get to a state where the energy starts moving and the chakras start opening up. However, some people, they don't even need to go through all of those Kriyas and the chakras just open up. So has anybody had any experience with chakras or with um, feeling energy blockage or it's interesting because one of the things also that that I've noticed from speaking to people and um, through my practice is that let's say you have you are constipated or uh, like regularly not just one time because you ate something bad that one time but let's say you have a tendency towards constipation or intestinal inflammation well when that energy center is unblocked, often that sensation goes away. And sometimes wherever you're hurting or you have issues in your body, you can try to go and see if, if it's good for you, where that, what energy that is and what it's associated with. And if there's a way to maybe deal with either the emotions that are associated to it or that energy that's maybe blocked and stagnated in the body. And it's really interesting because by paying attention to all of that, there's a lot of self-healing that can happen, which is pretty amazing. Are there any questions? Comments? Realizations? No. Yes, I said you go very, very deep for all of these things. Well, that's how we learn, right? And it yeah. might not interest you, but it's still nice to, like, it might not, any of the things I'm talking about might not touch you right away. It might not be, you might not have an automatic connection. Like for, for me, the chakras 15 years ago, eh, 
I was kind of like, no, nah, not now. I'll do something else. So you never know, but you still know about it now. So even if somebody who is interested talks about it, you know, you understand a little bit more. And, you know, knowledge, whoops, there goes my chakras. <laughs> um, a little bit of knowledge Power. is best to have, you know, when you're having a conversation with someone. Yeah. Okay. So any other questions about chakras, about... And I'll finish up. Felicia, Felicia yeah. I was going to ask you uh, uh, at the end of your presentation with, with yoga, what we can do is uh, we're going to um, open up to the class for some Q&A, just if there's any questions that they have about any specifics that they want, want to learn from you uh, before the end yeah. of class. So, um, so you, you continue and then at the end of, end of class, like, we can open it up for questions and answers if you like. Okay, so the last topic I wanted to share with you um, that I've been working on with my yoga group through the TLE is mudras. And I've been getting a lot of positive feedback that people love the mudras and they feel the benefits in their body. So I wanted to talk about the mudras. So what are mudras? Mudras are basically hand postures. So we talked about body postures. Um, which help us in our meditative state and help us get fit as well, physically and strong and flexible. But the mudras are hand postures. So they're ways that we move our fingers and hold them in meditation or even during our asanas, our postures. Uh, and it's very interesting because our fingers have pressure points, our feet have pre pressure points. So for example, in reflexology, um, you've probably heard of reflexology, there are specific points in the foot that you can touch that will affect parts of your body. But the same thing is true in our hands. And so the mudras are amazing because when you do practice a mudra, like the one that's there, okay, if, you, if you do that, where you're, you're taking your ring finger to your thumb, everyone wants to try it. And this one finger is out and the other two are straight out, okay? If you hold that posture with energy, just pay attention to where you feel that in your body. It affects you. I feel it right away here in my triceps and I feel it underneath in here. And then I feel it in my upper back here. So when you're doing mudras and you're holding your fingers a certain way, it's sending a message to different parts of your body. It's as if, as if there was a wire that is um, connecting you and another part of your body. So there are benefits to that that are great for your health. And so mudra also means a seal or a symbol. So it could be also a symbol of what it is you're trying to attain spiritually. So there's a physical benefit and there's a spiritual meditative benefit as well. So we see that there's a pattern happening through yoga where we're creating this unity of the body, the mind, and the spirit all the time. It's always trying to create the, um, the, the, that unity that's amazing. And what we do when we're doing mudras, when we're practicing mudras, to help enhance whatever benefits we're using, you know, like whatever you're trying to get. So, for example, dhyana. This is the dhyana mudra. Left hand, right hand over it, and the two thumbs touch. This one, when we hold it down towards our belly, which is also part of our chakras, um, is to help us get to a deeper state of consciousness. So it helps calm and it helps um, the focus. It helps with uh, Dharana and Dhyana. It helps with eight, like different limbs of yoga. It's just amazing. It helps with your physical. And in order to enhance it, you will do breathing techniques for the pranayama. You will do visualizations, so you can even close your eyes and visualize, imagine, you know, the breath is like a wave and it's it's flowing inside of you, or imagine that you are a lotus flower and your petals are opening. So you do that while you're doing the, the mudra. And also affirmations. Now, I love affirmations because they also go with ahimsa, nonviolence. So an affirmation is something that you state. It's, a, it's, a, it's an intention. It's, Something that you decide that you want to happen now, and you say it as though it's happened. So, 
So for instance, I could say an affirmation, um, if I want to become flexible, you know, flexible physically, but also flexible in my emotions and my way of reacting with people, I could say as an affirmation, I am flexible. And I could have my mudra and I could breathe and I could visualize and I could even create a visualization around being flexible, seeing things bend, thinking of the willow tree that, that bends and is very flexible. I can think about the birch tree that even in winter when there's lots of snow on top of it, boom, it goes down and it doesn't break, it just bends. So thinking about my affirmation, I, I am flexible, which means I want to be flexible. So I will say I am flexible. I'm coupling my mudra with it. And then I'm breathing and I'm visualizing what it means. And this brings me into a deeper state where I plant the seed of my affirmation. And then when I come into the waking state, my seed grows and then it becomes true and it does happen. So affirmations are very powerful and they're coupled with mudras and even with asanas. So you could be in an asana, well, I'm in an asana. You could be in a posture and have a mudra, hold a mudra and do the breathing and visualize and have your affirmation that you're repeating or that you're thinking about. So everything is interrelated. It all works together for that goal of unifying body, mind, and spirit. And I'll just show you a few of the mudras. So the first one is actually Ganesha. First one on the left at the top is Ganesha, where you put the two hands together. I, I personally love the feeling of that. If you want to try, just you take the left hand and the right hand, and you put your fingers inside like this, and you just hold. And it just feels so good. And then the Diana that I just spoke to you about. And then this one is Guyan. You want to try. Now, the thing with mudras is it's good to do both hands. It's always good to do both hands so that you're keeping your body balanced. And then this one is Prana, so bringing your life force together, where you have two fingers against your index and the other two straight up. So that is Prana Yoga, uh, Prana Mudra. And then you have Shuni, which is the one I showed you before. And then you have this one where you have your index and your ring finger, and then the other two are up. So it's kind of hard to do. It's, it's kind of like a, a puzzle. And this one is called Rudra. And then this one where you fold the ring finger down and you bring your thumb over like this. That one is called Surya. Yeah. <laughs> that was kind of hard too. And you know what's actually really good if you have arthritis or you have, you know, achy hands, it's good to practice the mudras too because it creates flexibility in your hands if you want the practical uh, reason for doing mudras. And then there's Bayu, which is this one where you're kind of hard to do, you're kind of holding your thumb under your index like that and you're pointing up. Yeah, you got it. That's awesome. Good. And you can feel that sometimes you feel blind directly and how it affects you physically. So we've learned about the um, history of yoga. We've learned about sacred texts. We've learned about the eight limbs of yoga, the four paths of yoga. We've learned about um, mudras and about the chakras. And we've learned about the concept that yoga is more than just an exercise routine. Yoga is a way of life. It's a philosophy, it's a science. Some people say it's a technology that helps your body and your mind and spirit coalesce and become one. And that yoga is all about being true to yourself and finding your true identity of who you are, not the ego of I'm Felicia, but that true essence of what am I, who am I, and how I connect to everything. So that is what yoga is. Thank you.